off. Okay, let me black out some stuff here. All right. Well, let me introduce myself so that you guys uh, know who I am. My name is Alan Delaney. I'm originally from Newport Beach, California. I currently reside in Nashville, Tennessee. Currently, I am working in Omaha. My background includes an extensive time in information, information technology. Now, I served as a chief operations officer for a company called Otis Technologies. We were a software development firm, and we, uh, we, we specialize in asset tracking software. So I know a little thing about technology, and this is a technology-based educational seminar, so I am qualified to give you this information. And understand this. <clears throat> This is really just an educational webinar. There's no sales hype here or anything like that. Uh, this is either going to be something that you enjoy and you want to get involved in or you don't. We realize already that this is not going to be for everybody. I work with clients such as Best Buy, Family Dollar, Chick-fil-A, Ralph Lauren, Build-A-Bear Workshop, Lowe's, Home Depot, Bed Bath & Beyond, Victoria's Secret, and a whole bunch of other high-profile retailers. But mainly our niche was creating both, uh, both accessible databases to track assets for these companies. And the reason I tell you this, it kind of gives me a little bit of special knowledge in, in, as it relates to tracking of values. And uh, that's why I was so attracted to this in the first place. So I'm going to share with you this evening, uh, I, I want to make a point. Again, this is not a sales presentation. It's an educational webinar with an emphasis on introducing uh, the beginning of something that I'll refer to as the Internet of Value. When the Internet was uh, first introduced, you know, it served as the Internet of Information. I think uh, everybody kind of remembers the billboard website, where really all you could do is read about a company and all that. It was like a still commercial almost. Then, then as the technology matured, so did the possibilities of new and exciting ways to use the technology, and the transformation was made to the Internet of Things. What we're talking about there. Uh, you're starting to see signs of cars that drive themselves. I mean, some crazy stuff going on right now, all made possible by a networked world, otherwise known as the Internet. Various smart machines use the technology to, you know, perform system checks, self-maintenance routines, and so on. An example of that is I just had a little bit of car trouble with my truck. The first thing the guy did was pull the plug on the computer and plug his computer into it so that these two devices could talk to each other and my truck could tell the other thing what, was wrong with it <laughs> crazy right the most fascinating and world-changing way to use the technology now is just now coming out you know new ideas take time and this emerging idea is I'm gonna refer to it as the internet of value that's something different from the internet of information from the internet of things and now the internet of value it's still very much in its infancy and my goal here is to educate you on why the future of banking, money transfer, remittance and services, smart contracts, and a whole bunch of other great stuff as it relates to the banking and finance industry. And the good news is, is that there's, you know, just like the dot-com boom, there's a great, there's many great ways that you can uh, not only benefit from these developments in technology, but there's a possibility that you can put yourself in a position for financial gain as well. So I want to set the table before we get going. I want to kind of, you know, put things into perspective. I think it's very, very important to do that. So I'm going to take us in the Wayback Machine uh, just to set the context because we, you know, basically we all understand the Internet today, right? But it, it really wasn't that long ago that very few people understood what that was. So I think this little short video kind of sets the stage. Listen closely. Success. I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Case that she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I've never heard it. Around I've never heard it said. I don't I see the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <laughs> yeah, I heard it around the lecture music. See, there it is. Violence at NBC GE com. I mean, well, well Allison should know. What, what do you is the internet that anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer network, network. Mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big? How does one, what do you write to it, like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? How about that? Now, 
we're not going to put these three together in the Mensa Society, that's for sure. But the truth of the matter is, is that the Today Show aired in 1994, and they had absolutely no clue what it was. Pretty amazing where the level of understanding was for most of us just a few short years ago. Now, basically, everyone on this webinar, I think I can say without fear of contradiction, uses the Internet every single day. And if you don't, you're using it right now because that's how we're delivering this content. The Internet has become ubiquitous in our lives. It's a part of everyday living. And look, guys, it hasn't been around that long. That's how fast this phenomenon took over. Here's a guy in 1995 that was published in Newsweek magazine. His name was Clifford Stoll. So not every, but this guy's a computer scientist. And you can tell from that really cool high-tech gear he has in the background there. But that's what it looked like in 1995. How far have we come, right? Okay. Basically, he published an article, and, and it was called Why the Internet Would Fail. So one of the things he said in the article, uh, Mr. Stoll cited that uh, things could never, ever be sold on the Internet because it was missing a key component. That was salespeople, right? So all we need to do is just ask Jeff Bezos of Amazon if missing salespeople have really affected his, his uh, sales. The truth is, this guy really thought that, and that's where our level of understanding on what this technology sh would bring to us. But, of course, he was wrong. And uh, we, we need to think for just a moment of how many of those kinds of ideas there have been. I mean, how many new technologies have influenced your life that just didn't exist, uh, you know, even just a few years ago? I think you'd find that uh, there are many, many, many of those. So let's talk about a couple of those. All right, on August 6, 1991, a guy named Tim Berners-Lee out of the UK invented what you now know, what we call, a lot of us call the Internet, but it's actually the World Wide Web. You see, the web runs on top of the Internet as an application. This is an important concept. The World Wide Web is a protocol. It's an application, hypertext transfer protocol. He said, the web as I envisions, envisaged it, one of these days I'm going to get that right, uh, we have not seen it yet. The future is so much bigger than the past. And I think that from the time that the Internet was just a billboard where you could read something to what we're doing on, doing on it today, like banking and just all kinds of critical applications, he was right. The future was so much bigger than the past, and it continues to be that way Today, how about July 5th, 1994? He takes uh, Tim Berners-Lee idea, uh, did Bezos, and he built Amazon, uh, which today is worth just absolutely tons of money. I think they have a larger market cap than, uh, than, than uh, uh, Walmart. They're worth $246.7 billion, and to be exact, that's about $16 billion more than Walmart. So uh, I think last year was the first year that uh, Cyber Monday actually outsold Black Friday. Pretty crazy. How about Google? These two boys, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, they started a, a, uh, a search engine with a new type of algorithm, another important word to remember, running in the uh, Stanford University lab. The, the, the actual website was called Backrub. It had become so bop popular that the bandwidth of the university couldn't support it anymore, and Google was born. Now, Google is one of these things that is pervasive in our lives. We use it every day. In fact, we use it so much, I can't even imagine Yahoo, Yahoo is really still around. I mean, there are other search engines, but no one ever says, I mean, Yahoo it, right? What do they say? They don't say search it. They say Google it. How about Facebook, February 4th, 2004? Mark Zuckerberg comes up with a great idea at Harvard University. Started out small. Today, it's ridiculous, all right? I think there's some, I, I can't even, I don't even know the number, so I'm not going to say, but the truth of the matter is that if Facebook were a nation, it would be the third largest nation in the world, and we can't talk about disruptions, we can't talk about all that kind of stuff, all these kinds of various uh, uh, technologies that have changed the way we do things without talking about Steve Jobs. June 29, 2007, he challenged his engineers to come up with a touchscreen, the rest, is history. That was the beginning of now what is known as mobile computing, right? You got iPhones, you got iPads, you have, you know, the, the, uh, the new uh, exploding model from Samsung, I think it is. Um, there's all kinds of ways 
to communicate now mobily. I mean, a laptop is sort of a mobile computing platform, but not like these things. And this would absolutely change the way the world would be shaped, and we are headed in that direction now. The one thing that all of these new technologies have is what? They're all digital. When we, we didn't used to be that way, right? Some people call it a microwave society because we want things in a hurry. Actually, we're just building efficiencies into the way that we live. I mean, how efficient is the postage stamp compared to email? Okay, how about Blockbusted? I mean, Blockbuster, right? Blockbuster didn't see the writing on the wall. Who were they replaced by? Netflix, again, a digital company delivering content directly to your devices. Now it's the norm. When was the last time you let your fingers do the walking? Never, right? That thing's a relic. It's a paperweight. Google replaced that. Search engines replaced that. So much faster. Now with Siri and other ways that you can even talk to your phone, you can find stuff. Uh, the Google app on the iPhone actually has its own way to talk to it. You don't even need Siri for that, right? And, of course, the rotary dial phone, we don't put our finger in the dial anymore. We simply use our smartphones. And that is the way innovation is progressing digitally. Look around you. Your car is digital. Everything's digital, right? You got this really neat new company that has this doorbell. And guess what it is? Digital. It actually shoots a picture to your smartphone anywhere you are in the world when someone rings your doorbell. How slick is that? What a great idea. Simple and good. That's where things are moving. But the biggest one of all is just in its infancy, and it's just starting. And we're talking about the new rule of finance, the new banking and finance industry. Traditional banking is, a, again, it's a fossil. It's a relic. It's, it's facing a ton of challenges. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, banking isn't delivering the level of service that customers are expecting, especially in regards, again, to technology, right? Regulatory requirements causing banks to spend an inordinate amount of discretionary budget on building systems and processes to keep up with escalating requirements. I want to back up to point one because I have a personal experience recently. I had a very small bank in Nashville, Tennessee, a concierge banker, had the same banker for a number of years, and unfortunately, they made a decision to uh, sell out to another small bank, but a little bit bigger. You know what my first question was? Do they have an app? And how is their online banking? You don't think that technology is a big part of banking today? Well, it is, folks. All right, customer dissatisfaction with abusive fees. We all know that. All right, are they going to charge me a fee to use my ATM? Do they charge me a fee if I don't maintain a special balance? People are sick of this stuff, right? They're totally sick of this stuff. But the main reason, the number one reason, is the increasing competition from smaller financial technology companies otherwise known as fintech. You'll hear that buzzword, all right, fintech companies. Fintechs are disrupting the way traditional banking has been done. You've heard the term bank in your pocket. There's all kinds of different things. How about Ally Bank, A-L-L-Y, no branches, all done over the internet, and they're a huge company, all right? This creates a big challenge for the traditional bricks and mortar bank because they it's like stopping the Titanic. They can't turn that quickly, and here's someone who knows, all right? This is Catherine Besant. She's the chief operations officer, technology officer for Bank of America. Now, she doesn't know exactly what the new financial world looks like. She just knows that if she doesn't move towards it, they're going to be left in the dust. Listen to this. How infant are you on blockchain? Well, my, you know, blockchain is very intriguing. And for us, it's a balance between not wanting to be Neanderthal, um, but not wanting to put something out in, in a commercial application where the commercial application is still very unclear. As a, as a technologist, the technology is fascinating. Um, and we have tried to stay on the forefront. I think we have um, somewhere around 15 patents. Most people would be surprised. Um, a Bank of America with patents in the blockchain or cryptocurrency space very important in the intellectual property world to reserve our spot even before we know what the commercial application might be. So very intrigued technologically, but what's the commercial application? Some blockchain developers are skeptical. They say actually big businesses don't understand what we're doing. They don't understand the practical applications. And as you say, you're kind of getting in there early. You've got your hands on it, even if you don't understand actually what you have your hands on. Well, the, the first definition of a Neanderthal is denial, right? <laughs> so the whole idea would be not to, to start from that perspective, 
So how about that? They don't really even know what they're going to use it for. They just know that they need to be involved. Look, they're not the only ones. You got Goldman Sachs, Barclays, UBS, the list goes on, Bank of England, Citigroup, Fidelity Investments, and so on and so forth. Everybody sees this technology as the next mover and where they need to be because of its ability to be transparent, because of its ability to reduce fees, because of its ability to eliminate uh, inefficiencies in an already inefficient system. So you got to ask your question, why is there so much interest in this new technology? Well, the reason is, is the unbanked in the world is one of the biggest reasons. There's over 2.3 billion people without banking services in the world. What? Look, you know somebody, I guarantee you know somebody who doesn't can't get a bank account. They either can't get a bank account because they don't qualify, maybe they don't make enough money, or all kinds of other reasons. The Global Findex database says this, lack of enough money to use an account. What did I just say? Distance to financial institutions. That seems weird to us, but not to someone who lives in, well, Nigeria, or perhaps Kenya, all right? It's not always easy to get from one place to the other. Prohibitive costs, we just talked about fees. Lack of trust in the banking system, and governments and central authorities that devaluate the dollars, all right, or the currency in any given country. Funny story. About, I don't know, three, four weeks ago, a good friend of mine, a guy that goes by the nickname Fort Knox, all right, you know who you are if you're out there, all right, this guy holds up a trillion dollar note from some foreign country in a meeting that I was in. It was hilarious. A trillion dollar note. Crazy. I think it was worth like 130 US dollars. It's worthless, basically. All right. So the reason that you should pay attention, the reason that you should care is not because the Winklevoss twins <clears throat> are here on this page, but it's what they notice. These guys own about 1% of all cryptocurrency known as Bitcoin. And this was their quote. It's the smartest people in the room that are most excited about this. So what are they seeing? Folks, this is cause and effect, right? You want to get what someone has, do what someone does. It's a simple law, all right? This isn't even a rule. It's a law, okay? Every time you light a firecracker and close your hand, you blow your hand off. Cause and effect. Do what successful people do. Get what successful people have. How about this guy, Sir Richard Branson, founder in the Virgin Group? Feels strange to think of a world without cash. No more notes or coins to find down the back of a sofa. But it appears that that's the way things are heading. You know Richard Branson uh, signed the uh, Rolling Stones, I believe it was, to Virgin Records back when he was a fledgling, you know, sort of uh, getting his businesses just started. No one would take a chance on the band. They were too rebellious. Hmm. Doesn't hurt to have a little vision, does it? How about Ben Bernanke? This is a guy who knows a thing or two about deflating dollars, right? Formal Federal Reserve Chairman, he knows about inefficiencies. He knows about money. Virtual currencies may hold long-term promise, particularly if the innovations promote a faster, more secure, and more efficient payment system. We're going to show you how that works. And, of course, you cannot talk about brilliant minds without talking about Bill Gates, uh, founder of Microsoft, right? In the future, financial transactions will be digital. That is a specific statement, folks. That's not a maybe, might be. Okay, they'll be digital, they'll be universal, this is important, and they'll be almost free. That's why merchants are so uh, excited about this new technology, because they pay a ton of transaction fees. What about this? Whole countries are going to a cashless, uh, a cashless society, right? Sweden down to just 3% of the national economy. Kenya has 19 million, 19 million subscribers to a technology called M-Pesa, which, by the way, Mark Zuckerberg, founder of, of Facebook, is trying to purchase right now. All right, pay attention to the clues. Pay attention to the clues. It's important. All right, Canada hasn't printed any money, no more coins or paper currency since 2013. These are big time clues. So what in the world are you talking about, Alan? What's a blockchain? Is that like a, you know, a cinder block with a chain wrapped around it? You know, what is cryptocurrency? These are great questions, and you could spend hours and hours and hours reading and learning and watching things about it. So we're not going to attempt to answer this question, uh, you know, in a few short sentences here tonight. Just know, you just heard Catherine Besant talk about it. 
She's the chief technology officer, of one of the largest banks in the world. Clue, all right? The Winklevoss twins, stating that the smartest people in the room are the most excited about this technology. Clue, all right? We're here to bring you some of these clues, right? So to do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about the evolution of money. It all started out with precious metals, right? At least as back, far as back as we wanna go. I know the Romans used salt, and we can go back to the beginning of whatever. But the truth of the matter is, uh, this is about where we need to start, precious metals. From there, we went to paper money because it was easier to carry around. Didn't need a big sack, didn't need to weigh it every single time you used it. We used tokens called coins to represent some monetary amount. Then we moved on to the digital world. Most people don't even think of this as digital money, but it is, and I'm going to prove it to you right now, all right? The last time you got a brand spanking new credit card with a $10,000 limit on it, you did not receive money. What you received was credit, a ledger, an electronic entry somewhere in the world in a database that said you were credit worthy for 10 grand. When you went and spent money, you did not transact in paper or coin. You did not give anybody any money yet. You walked out with their goods, but what happened behind the scene was a bunch of ledgers got adjusted digitally, didn't they? Then your bill came in the mail. You did not run down to the credit card company to pay the bill with paper and coin, did you? No, you either wrote a paper check, known as a promissory note, which is nothing more than directing your bank to send more ones and digital zeros over to the credit card company, or you went into online banking and did it yourself, didn't you? Yes, and did the company really receive money that owns a credit card? No, we've been digital for a long time. From there, it went to PayPal. Pop Money, Rocket Pays, Venmo, even Facebook Messenger now has an option for linking your bank account to your Messenger, and you can send up to two thousand dollars a day. Uh, you know, in in transactions for guess what? How much in fees? Zero, folks. Zero. From there, we went on to Samsung Pay, Google Wallet, Apple Pay. Now look, I got to make a point here, and it'll be relevant later on down the road. 25 years ago, if I would have said to you, you would have this device that looked mysteriously like something that Spock used to talk to to get beamed up, and you'd be able to talk to it. Listen, Siri, pay my friend, all right, or whatever, and that this technology, you'd look at me cross-eyed and go, this boy is, you know, a few bricks short of a pile, right? This is here. This is what happens. We are already passing that, and the next evolution is a bank in your pocket using this very same device funded with something called cryptocurrency. In its exciting time, the first of its kind uh, was, a, was a coin called Bitcoin. Now, the reasons for its creation on uh, Halloween 2008 is it doesn't matter why it was created. It was created for the reason that it was. You know, they wanted to prove that you didn't need a central authority or government to transact. Done. Proved. It was created to provide an alternative to the banking system. Okay, cryptocurrency is issued. All cryptocurrencies are issued according to a fixed set of rules. That's an important point, right? A fixed set of rules. Why is that important? Because is our money, our current currency, the US dollar or any other fiat currency, is it fixed? I don't know. Let's think about 2008. Thing called a bailout. Not fixed, folks, not fixed. And since 1971, there's no precious metal behind it. What are these things? They're promissory notes. They're not, they're legal tender by way of law. They're a dollar because society says it's a dollar. It's just a piece of paper that has a serial number on it. What do you think cryptocurrency is? It's a serial number without the paper. Why? Because this is, we're, we are a digital world. It only makes sense, folks, right? So why is cryptocurrency a better way? Simply put, it's more secure. There's a fixed amount of it. Again, people can't push a button, buy some paper and ink for like, you know, oh, I don't know, $10,000, $20,000, turn that into billions, lend it to our government, and collect the interest off of it, destroying our economy. No. All right, it's counterfeit proof. Why is it counterfeit proof, Alan? Well, it's counterfeit proof because it's protected by PGP, 
which stands for pretty good privacy, which is the strongest cryptography in the world. I don't know why they didn't call it RGP, really good privacy. They didn't. It's called PGP. It's the strongest encryption in the world. If I were to take the time to show you what a hashed out phrase looks like, it, you, you would never, I mean, you could take all the computers. This is the honest to God's truth. Something that is hashed out that way, you could take all the computers in the world until the end of time, you would not be able to hack it. Counterfeit proof. It's not a file you can copy, all right? It's a, it, 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 it allows peer-to-peer -peer transaction. I'm a peer. My friend Shan is a peer. My wife is a peer. My daughter is a peer. In other words, I don't need to go, right now, if the only peer-to-peer -peer transacting we have is a dollar bill, it's cash. I take it out of my pocket, I give it to my friend. It left my pocket. It's the only one of its kind, of course, unless it's been counterfeited. That's what peer-to-peer -peer transacting is. I don't need to go through that bank or central authority to have a transaction, and the fees are negligible, so that's super important. So how is it created? It's mine. People would call it digital gold. What is mine? What does that mean? All right? I'm not going to go into the big details of this. I could spend three hours on this alone, but I'm not going to do it. Just understand that it's a special type of computer that solves special mathematical problems in a fixed set of rules. And when it does this successfully, it gets a reward. It's like throw the dog a bone. All right, that reward is cryptocurrency. Now, there are many types of blockchains out there, and they all have different rates of creation. Right now, I'm proud to say that the company that we're sharing with you here tonight, this idea and their cryptocurrency is one of the fastest in the world, generating over 50,000 of these serial numbers every 60 seconds. That's 72 million a day. All right, they have over, they have currently 120 billion serial numbers. Those are fixed. There'll never be 120 billion and one. Okay, the reason that one person can't mine it all is because of something called the difficulty factor. It gets harder and harder and harder to find this stuff. That's by design. Okay, the designers of cryptocurrency built in an organic scarcity just like gold. Look, if we could walk out into our front yards and pick up gold nuggets, would they be worth anything? No, they wouldn't be, just like your blades of grass aren't worth anything much, all right? That's the reality of it. The, the mining factor goes up, the difficulty factor goes up, I should say, okay? And it gets harder to find this currency. When it gets harder to find this currency, it gains in value for most part, okay? In 2009, the originator, the Bitcoin was valued at just 10 cents. Actually, when it first got started, um, it was only worth like double lot 25, you know, a quarter of a penny, all right? But more and more people started to mine this Bitcoin, all right, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And by 2013, these little things for 10 cents had rose all the way up to $1,242.03 at its peak. Crazy, crazy, crazy climb. Uh, and it's still one of the most talked about rises in the financial and fintech industry. And here's a guy who took action. This guy is a former military guy. His name is Jared Kenna. He spent time over in Afghanistan. He spent time in Chile. And you know what he noticed? It was very hard to get money from one place to another. So he purchased Bitcoins because why? They can be transferred from a smartphone to a dumb phone, like a Nokia Flip. You don't need any paper. You don't have to go through a bank. This is a revolutionary idea, guys. People have laughed at revolutionary ideas. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So he purchased his first round of Bitcoins for 20 cents a piece, spent a grand. He traded those in after that rise for about $2.58 a pop, 20 cents to $2.58. He profited at $1.29 million. Now, I didn't stop there. This guy founded a trading exchange for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies called Trade Hill. It became the second largest Bitcoin exchange in the world, headquartered in Panama. Okay, founded 20 Mission. That is a think tank for, for uh, cryptocurrency enthusiasts and blockchain enthusiasts. This guy really took advantage. But here's the problem. For as many stories like that as there are, there are tons of other stories about people whose minds are like closed parachutes. They fall directly from the, from the plane and hit the ground and bounce, right? Your mind is like a parachute. All right, for this to work for you, 
you have to have you have to have a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. You have to be willing to take the risk to lose or win. All right. I mean, you don't want to go to sunblog.com or Google the greatest search tool in the world, but the lousiest research tool. Look, research requires a lot of effort. It requires looking up documents. It, you die, reading a blog, okay, is an opinion editorial. Everybody's got an opinion. They're just like you know what's. Everybody's got one. They're the National Enquirer of the Internet. Blogs are financially incentivized to print what sells. You've heard the phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. Bad news is the best news for a blogger. So they always share bad news. Look, don't distrust your friend that might have invited you to this information and trust some guy you don't even know. I can put a blog up in 15 minutes and write whatever I wanted to write about anybody I wanted to write. Doesn't make it necessarily true, does it? No, it doesn't. Please don't get, please don't get stuck in that, in that mindset. All right, so who are the top players in this idea? This is a little bit of an antiquated slide, I admit. All right, but you can see 10 of them right here. Uh, this is pulled from a website called xcoinx.com, currently under maintenance in order to facilitate information from our new blockchain. But let's talk about, at this time, who the market leaders were. Bitcoin, after seven years, coming up on eight, at 9.6 billion market capitalization, with a coin valued at about 609 bucks with about 15.8 million in circulation. There's a total of 21 million Bitcoins, so there's about 6 million still to come. How about OneCoin? Been in business for now two years, $6.5 billion market cap, which is going to be far greater very shortly, and a coin valued at $7.78 USD, 840 million in circulation. So here's the deal. All right, whoops, I was supposed to push this a minute ago. My bad. Okay, so here's the deal, okay? If you, if, first of all, 609 bucks for one coin, uh, for one Bitcoin, I mean, that's awesome if you bought them when they were worth 10 bucks. But to get one now, it's, it's difficult. You see, Bitcoin has been public for a long time. And as such, um, they've grown in value. And so now they're harder to find. You can't mine them unless you join a mining pool, which we have. Uh, we have some of those for our very own coin. But at $7.78 for our coin, anybody can play. And that was the idea behind the whole thing. This is our founder. Her name is Dr. Ruja Ignatova. Okay. She was born in Sofia, Bulgaria, raised in Germany. Uh, she, is, uh, a member, she is a member of the Mensa Society, right? Uh, she's married to a German attorney. She had obtained her law degree from Oxford University, master's degree in economics from Constance University. Um, I've been told she did those at the same time. That's pretty insane. She has a PhD in law, University of Oxford and Constance, wrote a thesis on corporate litigation within the European Union. She's a former associate partner with McKinsey and Company. That's a giant consulting firm. Folks, I encourage anybody to go on Google because I don't know the web address personally, and look up McKinsey Consulting or McKinsey and Company. Go to their website and in their search box, type Dr. Ruja Ignatova. You will find her picture there, and you will find some of the papers and projects that she consulted on. That's the real deal. Now we're doing some research. All right, former CEO and CFO of one of the biggest asset management funds in Bulgaria. She managed over 250 million euro assets. The lady knows what she's doing. She spoke at The Economist, uh, something called the Countdown of Stability and Growth. It was the fourth European summit. The Economist magazine, you know that magazine. It's a legit magazine. This was in 2015 in Sofia, Bulgaria. She was a keynote speaker there. She spoke, look, you cannot speak to people like this. You don't have people that are on the same platform as you are and in the crowd taking notes like Carl Bildt, former prime minister of Sweden, Meglena Kuneva, deputy prime minister for European policies, coordination, and institutional affairs for an entire country. Nikos Kavanopoulos, this guy works for Visa. He's the general manager for Greece, Cyprus, Bulgaria, and Eastern Europe. And this other cat down there who's the economic advisor to the president of Croatia, look, these are heavy hitters in the finance world. 
They're listening to our finder, founder about the future of payments, the future of remittances, and why cryptocurrency is doing what it's doing. She was on the cover of Forbes Brand Voice magazine. All right, this is not Forbes magazine. Let me make this crystal clear. This is an advertisement. All right, you still got to pay two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars to get in the daggum thing, and you still have to go through an unbelievable background check and meticulous vetting process before they'll put you on the cover. In other words, you have to be legit, right? And why would we do that? Well, because you, it's got a great audience. People read this thing. It adds to the credibility of the person, the company, and their products. And the results are tremendous, all right? <clears throat> but most recently, and something we're very proud of, is that she was on the cover of something called Financial IT Magazine. Financialit.net is where you can go purchase your own copy of this magazine, all right? What is financial IT? Well, you know, it's not better homes and gardens, I'll tell you that. You're not going to find it all over the place. But it is a cutting-edge financial technology magazine with a specialty in covering the latest trends in payments and cash management. It's subscribed to by over 2,000 banks and financial institutions. And the interview on Dr. Ignatova was uh, performed by its publisher, Chris Principe. Now, there's a backstory here, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Let's just say that Chris Principe wasn't fully convinced, uh, like a lot of people in the beginning, that we or and or our founder were legitimate. But after he literally sat down and spoke with her, this is what he had to say. One coin is leading the charge of acquiring the masses into the cryptocurrency shift across the globe. They're doing an amazing job at taking what is normally the complicated idea of cryptocurrency and making it ultra simple and easy to understand so anyone can get involved and profit from it. And that was from the, 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 the publisher of this magazine. So we're super excited about that. Major universities see the future. Duke, University of Maryland, MIT, NYU, Princeton, Stanford, the list goes on, are offering courses in blockchain technology in cryptocurrency about its effects on the future uh, our youth our economy how is it going to work how is it going to affect us what industries is it going to change and look they charge anywhere from 13 to 18 thousand dollars per course well education is our product as well we have a website called oneacademy.eu you can go there tonight take a look look at our various packages it's available in 231 different countries with 1.7 million students 20 languages, 1,800 minutes of video, and 18 individual trainings. A great website with a lot of information that you need to know. Okay, so here's what's included. When you purchase an educational package, you, you get a back office. That's a, that's a picture of the dashboard there. You also get account management so you can keep track of what's going on. News and updates about the industry of banking, finance, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and so on. You get an exchange where you can put your education to use, buying, selling, trading. And you get educational tracking because with every one of our courses, there's a certification test and you can get a nice certificate uh, when upon completion. So that's awesome. The coin value continues to rise upward. And this is really, guys, this is exactly what's happened to the coin, although I must disclaim it by saying this. There's no price guarantee here. There's none implied. This is for illustration purposes only. Okay? There aren't any guarantees in life except two things. You guys know what those are. All right? So here's the reality. Um, well, maybe three things, but I'm not going to get political on this particular <laughs> webinar. All right? My wife and I were fortunate enough to be involved now for just over a year. It was about $1.78 when we got involved. Okay? It's now... Like I told you earlier, it's $7.78 USD. That's the value of the coin. Now, let's be clear about something, okay? There is nowhere I can spend these coins just yet. Well, there's a couple of places, but no, nothing, nothing uh, you know, that's easy for me to get to. But that's okay, because for the first 19 months of Bitcoin, there was no place to spend it either. All right, we are very much in a trailblazing pioneering phase here. Again, that's not for everybody. If it were everybody, it would be, you know, Warren Buffett 
or Donald Trump or anybody else who is willing to take a risk for success. I realize that's not for everybody. You know, we need people that aren't like that. If everybody was like that, it'd be a strange society. But I am telling you, that's what's happened to the coin. This is our most popular package, and the time to act is now. There's a couple of different reasons. Get with a person that invited you to this information to find out some, but we've got an unbelievable promotion going on right now, something called the Super Split, and they'll be able to explain that to you. So, you know, nobody ever won anything by procrastinating. So if you look at this idea and you think, wow, that's something I'd like to be a part of, then do it. Don't think about it. But if you look at it and you need to think about it, take all the time you need. Again, we realize it's not for everybody. Okay, this contains five levels of our One Academy education modules and 81,818 promotional free tokens. All right, understand this. All right, this is an educational package that you're purchasing. It comes with free promotional tokens, 81,818 of them, that after some splitting and patience, can turn into more and you are not buying cryptocurrency here you're not investing your money here you are buying an educational package you are becoming a miner all right in order to get this coin into circulation once the merchants start to accept this currency it will gain in value and that's where you stand your chance to perhaps benefit financially from that but again crystal clear you are joining a mining pool here, and you are able to get your coins, your serial numbers for your digital wallet at wholesale. That opportunity will be gone in approximately 18 months, so don't wait. All right, this includes our exclusive auto mining feature, meaning that you set it and forget it. It happens all automatically for you. That's the part where Chris Principe was saying, hey, they made it simple. All right, and it provides an optimized trading experience for you. All right, now I want to. One of my good friends, we'll just call him Mr. G, brought back some information from a recent event in Bangkok, Thailand, and I just absolutely love it. And it was actually called All Truth Passes Through Three Stages. When I heard this, it kind of, this is a new slide for me, so I'm going to spend a minute on it. All right. It just blew my mind because it was revolutionary in my mind, okay? Gandhi used this uh, phrase, and I've kind of gone off of his. There's another guy, too, that calls it all truth passes through three stages. But here, here's the truth. First, it's ridiculed. What do I mean? Here's what I mean. People say things like, oh, that'll never work. Oh, my gosh, this idea is garbage. Or have you lost your mind? Look, we've all heard it. Okay, our friends love to beat us up when we're trying to get outside the comfort zone. When we step just outside the box, we're like, oh, no, come back to the box. I need you in here. So great truths are ridiculed at first. Second, it gets violently opposed. Oh, my gosh, this might have some traction, right? So I need to oppose it because I need to stay in my little thinking box, right? This thing's a scam. This is a Ponzi scheme. We've all heard it. You can read it anywhere on the internet about any number of things. You can definitely read it about our company. I'm not afraid to say it out loud. Look, just because Google says so doesn't make it true, right? That's like telling me that everything you see on CNN is a fact. No, not true. Third, now it's accepted as being self-evident. What does that mean? That means it's axiomatic. That means it doesn't have to be explained anymore. That means that it's unquestionable because it's a reality. That's what that means. There are many things that started out that went through these three first three stages of truth. All right, ridiculed, violently opposed. Okay, a great story that my friend Mr. G told me was this. There was a guy out there, right? And this guy came up with this idea in his garage. Now, this idea that he had in his garage, he decided to take it to manufacturing. So he pressed out 10,000 of these units. And then he went to a company and he tried to sell these 10,000 units. And the company told him he was out of his mind. It would never work. Are you crazy? Who would want to put a computer on their desk? This guy was Steve Jobs and that company was Apple. Ridiculed violently opposed and let me tell you there isn't anything 
more self-evident. So, Alan, what is the fourth stage? Simple. You win. Your idea becomes ubiquitous. Apple, the Wright brothers. You want to talk about guys that got ridiculed? We're going to fly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you are. Okay? Or the light bulb. You win, guys. It's the people with courage, the people with values, the people that are willing to take a risk that win. That's why you, some of you people on this phone call are going, man, it's always the other guy that has the good luck. No, the other guy believed in something and went for it. He may have believed in 10 things and went for them. And the first nine took him down, but he had the courage to continue on. That's what it takes here. So if that's not for you, I totally understand. You know, my friend said to me this. My wife and I have a substantial amount of money that we have purchased educational packages with. Why? Because we wanted more promotional tokens. Simple. And my friend said this, man, what if that doesn't work? What if that doesn't work? I said, what if it does? I don't want to be the only one of my friends that didn't take advantage of it when it worked. That would be me laying right there in the middle of that airplane taking that risk. I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll become a winner too. Our vision is simple. We want to provide financial services for everyone in the world, not just the established nations, but to those, you know, third world countries that are impoverished, the underdeveloped nations of the world where what you and I take for granted is financial services or the norm being charged ridiculous rates exist. Look, that is not all over the world. We're doing that through three different websites onecoin.eu, onelife.eu, and oneacademy.eu. Again, folks, I want to take uh, this moment to say thank you for your time. I hope this has been educational for you. I hope you learned something here. Um, if you have a question, I'm going to hang on for just a few minutes. If you are on this call, uh, this is not about how do I build my business or anything like that, but I'll answer as many questions as I possibly can. Thanks for watching. I appreciate all of you.